Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Reinsurance Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jared Lee. And I'm Ben Rose. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't we hear your responses. <laughs> we assume it's a screaming okay. It's an we, odd thing to scream. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am okay. Yeah. I feel it's like, it's like the, the, the GIF meme of the like little stick figure like shouting with its little... Stick uh, arms into the air. There's somebody Speaking there. of... Why are you shouting? <laughs> I just want Jared and Ben to be able to hear me from wherever they are. It's most likely Bermuda. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for listening, OK Person. We are talking today about the the sort of talent sort of challenges and how do we attract talent into the reinsurance space. The war on talent. The war on talent. F- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've been... I've been Coming up with controversial names for things, and I, th- I think that's a good, a good, yeah. exciting stance. So yeah. we're on the war on talent. How do you get it? How do you? Why well, not? How do you beat it? How do yeah. you? How do well, you defeat the challenges of attracting good talent, yeah. retaining talent, and incentivizing, incentivizing, talent. motivating? Yeah. I. Well, we we've talked before. We growing existing talent, talent, nurturing, nurturing, yeah, cultivating, yeah, all these verbs. Oh. We're like a regular thesaurus over here. <laughs> um, but in a previous episode with with Russell Higginbotham, um, we talked a lot about why this industry is an exciting one to work in. Mm. And I think for most people, you know, once you sort of find yourself in reinsurance for whichever route you have taken, um, it's very quickly w- an industry you find deeply fascinating and intriguing and engaging and um, um, fulfilling. But I think the challenge the industry has faced, and we've talked about it a lot, there was some London Market Matters work that came out a number of years ago, but there's been this narrative over the last several years about how do we attract the best talent into this space. And when you look at some of that, the most talented people in the younger generations going to more and more technology companies or to the big banks or to, you know, it, how do we compete and attract them maybe out of the gates and then... From there, how do we make sure we're, you know, motivating and cultivating and incentivizing and all your other verbs? Indeed. And, and I think we can't really even dive into that journey without asking, or oh, it's a bit of a trick question, I think, mm. based on the answer I intend to give. But I, what is the best talent? You know, how do you, how do you even identify what good talent yeah. looks for, for the needs of the industry today, the diversity that's required to operate a good insurance mm. or reinsurance vehicle of some kind i because we're, we're outliers i think in some ways but actually I, I think less so than we might imagine i mm. i came into the industry via a music degree yeah you know which seems very odd likewise jared came in as a champion modern dancer <laughs> <laughs> you know, a psychology they write yeah. it's not the obvious translation into yeah. in, in insurance and you hear this sort of mixture of narratives of on one hand, the industry becoming more technical, mm-hmm. uh, going from a relatively less numerate, not new, that sounds like people can't add up numbers, but <laughs> you know, less a uh, specifically calculated uh, outcomes, more, more relationship-based and yeah. who you know than what you know, yeah. historically to more of a, you know, nowadays brokers and underwriters are actually trained as actuaries before they take on the job kind yeah. of thing, which, which is a huge uh, technical uplift yeah. in a lot of those roles. But at the same time, we still really benefit from the soft skills, the management, the uh, ability to see the bigger picture, to innovate that can often come with people with arts degrees and so yeah. on. I, so yeah, what do you think is the, if you had to choose, what would be your ideal profile for somebody joining the industry? And, and also I should say, not even presuming that they've come via a degree route because apprenticeships yeah. have also taken off in the industry as yeah. well. Their apprenticeships, I'm, I'm a massive fan of, but they're much more common here in the UK than, and, and I think maybe in other parts of Europe, but they're not at all common yet in, mm. in the US, which I, I think is a missed opportunity. Mm. I think there's a lot of things in our industry that you can learn and teach your way into, and I think that's super um, a huge opportunity that gets missed at times. Um, I think the reason we talk about this sort of war for talent and the, the need to sort of attract that is because I think we're looking at it as you were sort of alluding to correctly that that newer generation or this now generation in many ways as, as you're framing it, which I'm a massive fan of, um, 
is needing to be more technical. So how do we attract those individuals um, who can who have the sort of aptitude to pick up the sort of more technical parts of the roles from catastrophe modeling to actuarial sort of modeling and um, sciences, as well as understanding the sort of financial components of structures and pricing and the nuance that goes into that. So I think there's certainly, when we talk about this pursuit of the best talent, that's the lens we're looking at it from. Someone who could go be a data scientist at a major tech firm or could go be, you know, a quant at a hedge fund or yeah. something. How do we attract them? Um, I mean, but in, I, in particular, like software developers, you know, yeah. getting them into the space is a nightmare for yeah. most insurance firms. Well, like, do you like to work on yeah. our mainframe insurance policy administration system? Or would you like to build an app for autonomous cars? Yeah. Or something? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to build avatars for the metaverse? You're like, that sounds way more fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, th I think there's that's the that's the lens in which we're sort of tackling this mm -hmm. war for talent. Um, but I think we'd be remiss to not talk about the diversity of opportunities in our space, mm -hmm. right? You have um, everything from marketing teams and copywriting teams and contract teams and legal teams and there's, you know, people and HR functions and everything else. So there's there's a huge array of roles that sit across our industry, but we've, prim we've primarily focused this, like, quote-unquote, like, war for talent on this very specific group, which I think makes sense in in the sort of scarcity of that audience and the need to get the best. I, th I think it's probably because we've had this lifting of the bar for quality in things like data, especially where there's less forgiveness for inaccuracy and, you know, <laughs> not being able to evidence things through very rigorous actuarial methods. I so I do think that we're right to focus on that area, but as you say, not to lose sight of the value of others who have different uh, backgrounds or different experiences. In particular, I, I was thinking about this the other day in terms of like what would be the ideal degrees to have studied or similar to come into the industry. And actually one of the ones that stood out for me potentially was geography, mm -hmm. I, partly because it has this balance of like physical geography where you study, you know, all the sorts of things we insure against from a nat natcat side of things, yep. but then also human geography where we think about political violence and you know migration and globalization and all all these sort of themes which are very useful for the cognition of what on earth is happening in the world. But then the more I thought about it, I was finding similar justifications for virtually every degree topic. Yeah. I was like, oh, but history is all about you know the risk that history repeats itself and thinking about how you know patterns occur and various analytical uh, pattern spotting yeah. kind of subjects. Well, economics makes tons of sense. Being um, a biochemist probably gives you a massive leg up if you're looking to ensure pharma yeah. <laughs> companies. Yeah. We, we've, you know, we've spoken on the, this show to like uh, space uh, risk mm -hmm. underwriters who come from a, you know, an actual, well, they used to build space rockets kind of yeah. background. So in a, in a way, because the insurance and reinsurance world is a mirror to all of the human and non-human activities we experience in our lives. Yeah. To some extent, the more broadly we can reflect all of those different aspects of the world, the better a chance we have in being able to accommodate it in yeah. the products and services we offer, right? Like, I, if you want to offer coverage against something that's very niche or very specific or very regionally specific or very culturally specific you've got to have somebody with experience and a mindset and a way of understanding that to begin with yeah and then i guess the, the sort of depth comes from okay now can you actually bring the rigor of the actuarial sciences the data science to be able to do that and then all of the various other functions you mentioned get the people the marketing the yeah. uh, operations finance etc to support those functions but in terms of relating our value proposition to the world, we have to be as broad as the world to yeah. do that. Well, I think we're currently going through a, a stage, and I think this will continue, but we're having increased specialisms in our space mm -hmm. where before it was maybe less so. And mm -hmm. I say that just more of it was at a higher level. So here's a big pool of capital, and we can kind mm -hmm. of categorically put it towards things and but the rise of things like mgas and the rise of specialist underwriters and class underwriters is essentially driving towards to do this exceptionally well we have to have people who understand 
the underlying elements of how rockets get built, as to your example, or how you know how farming and mm-hmm. agriculture works, and how the climate impacts these specific areas, and that matters to help build models or you know pricing tools or whatever else that might be. So I think part of this um, focus on how we attract the best talent is a little bit of a branding issue, which I think insurance mm-hmm. has always had a bit of a branding issue in, in many ways. But how do we find people who are passionate about a certain area that they've studied but see insurance as a vehicle in which they can work to ensure that thing continues to thrive and grow and yeah, yeah. do better, right? How do you take someone who's deeply fascinated with agriculture and see insurance as a space in which they can work to ensure the prosperity of that industry yeah. in many ways? That's a really good point. And it's one, even if I think back to my route into the industry, I it's something that was front of mind for me when I was, I think, coming to terms with the fact that I'd done a music degree mm. beforehand, I, because there wasn't an obvious map for that in the insurance space. And I think the closest thing, weirdly, that I could find when I went through all the lines of business that people offered was a fine-arted species, yeah. interestingly. <laughs> yeah. It's in this weird, uh, you know, appreciation of the arts yeah. kind of side, side of thing. Not event cancellation. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, I mean, that would have been another good one, yeah. right? I, or even... I. Yeah, copyright infringement. Is that something <laughs> in, in that world? Uh, musical instrument insurance. I remember on my internship, I, I built my first model for uh, pricing yeah. piano damage yeah. insurance or something. It was quite fun. I, but anyway, in that journey, it was fascinating for me because I, I tried. I looked at the instrument and said, okay, my expertise is, is music. I know what it's like to be a musician and to mm. I think about the world f- through that lens. I how do I map that to the insurance world? And I remember a a very kind fine art and species underwriter let me meet with them and, and talk me through their day and their daily life and mm. what they covered. And they said, look, to be honest with you, I, as much as the label is fine art and species and we have, you know, art hanging in our offices and all this sort of thing, to be honest with you, what I've actually done is, yes, I too had a background in fine art and that was what I studied. And I'm, you know, at, at the university age, I was an expert in understanding art history and all, the, all these aspects. But actually, my expertise changed radically when I joined the industry in a way that I actually really enjoyed, mm. I, where I became an expert in transporting you know, really fragile but valuable objects and learning where things can go wrong, mm-hmm. working out who the best suppliers are for I, you know, logistics uh, when it comes to transporting oddly shaped sculptures and things working out when things are most likely to break and how much it's likely to cost. Uh, so staying sort of indirectly close to the subject matter, but actually learning an entirely new set of skills relating to it rather than just being like a, an academic or an expert. Yeah. And I, th- I think actually that's maybe something we don't sell very well is that a career in insurance is not just a chance to come and focus on something that you're interested in anyway or something that you might discover an interest in but it's also a chance to overlay a whole new set of skills yep. on top of that foundation. You know, like if you're somebody who's passionate about sailing, mm. right? You come into the marine uh, underwriting or breaking world, you're not going to be just, thanks, you know about ships, you sit there and we'll ask you questions occasionally. You're going to be taught an entirely new skill set where you begin to appreciate probably all sorts of vessel that you'd never come across before, the risks of, uh, for example, uh, it's a famous legal term that only a few mar- marine law experts will know, but bottom fouling, mm. uh, which is when boats get stuck in harbours for too long and then they get ruined by things clinging to the bottom of the boat. Uh, you start to learn about uh, nautical law and areas where boats are allowed to go based on policy constraints. You start to learn about uh, the risk of steve doors not closing the doors of boats when they've been loaded with cargo and setting off too soon and then sinking because they've been pushed out to sea before they <laughs> remember to actually close the back door. Yeah. I like, All sorts of yeah. really, really fascinating ways of continuing your your learning and your passion yeah. for a subject and finding out. It's that, it's that niche <laughs> that just keeps on going in yeah. insurance, right? There's so much to learn and so much to discover, which I think is, is really undersold. Externally. Yeah. Well, it, it kind of makes me think about this, the, like you're just digging deeper into what drives things. It, as an analogy, they love, we, we know we love analogies, but you think about like parts of history and it's interesting to be like, oh, this, you know, battle or this war, this, you know, founda- founding of this nation, like 
historical event that has always interested me. But if you sp if you like study for a, a degree in that specific thing, you're beginning to learn about the underlying characters and their pos you know political positioning or the other factors that this one nation was wrestling with from battles elsewhere or an economic position that doesn't really get talked about but was the really justification for why they didn't invest in this war effort. Or, and you're learning all of these layered things. This is very, very similar to going, I kind of take for granted that there's the sculpture in this building and then it got moved and now it's currently on loan from this museum and yeah, it's there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, of course it's here now, it's on loan. But like hundreds of things had mm -hmm. to, were involved to bring it from, you know, to be packaged and shipped and um, whilst it was at sea and mm -hmm. then in transit. And, and then even, even who the, the sort of transition of who was on risk at various points in that journey. Yeah. So it's like, it's, you're at risk whilst it's in this building, but the second it leaves this door, this person's now at risk. And the second it gets on the boat, it's this person. The second it comes off the harbor, it's this person. The second it goes, and there's this like chain that's, ha and all of that is really, really interesting if you're in an area that you already kind of are interested in more generally. And I think you're right, we undersell, the, we undersell that massively. And I think you know, when it comes to then attracting these kind of people, there's always going to be competition if they're good and if they they know their yeah. stuff. And I and also generalists. I don't want to forget about the power of generalists. You know, to be able to make sense of many many expertises collected into a portfolio company, right? Somebody mm -hmm. who can bring together and unite all those people with different interests. But another example that came to mind is like, how do you take somebody who's just done a a master's in international relations or geopolitics or something like that, uh, and you know their job options are well i can go and work for the un or the world bank or you know all these really exciting meaningful causes mm -hmm. but being able to say to them actually yes you could do that i we have an equally if not even more interesting path where you're trying to price in the risk of you know a new war on this continent or civil unrest mm -hmm. due to this very current issue you know we're not talking about you going to do a doctorate in the history of this thing and some subtle nuance that you know you're one of five people in the world who cares about it yeah we're talking about this could happen next year and we need to prepare for it and price it and understand the risk of it yeah. and make sense of all the intelligence we're getting from people on the ground and interviews and it, it's like the the applic real world application of some yeah. things which you don't get from a lot of other sectors well i think the reason it's so important we talk about how we retain talent is i think i think we can do a better job of attracting it but as we've sort of been discussing, attracting the talent can be easier if we invest mm -hmm. in our brand and we invest in these sort of storytelling um, components. The reason it's important we continue to invest in continue to invest in technology is because if we can recruit on that basis, and then we say, so by the way, what you're going to spend most of your day actually doing though is. Yeah, yeah taking apart this paper document and reading through it and then rekeying 25 of the numbers in this document into the spreadsheet. Then you're going to get another document and you're going to do that. You're going to spend the better part of your week doing this. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and then very quickly you've gone, you have someone going, I turned down the World Bank though to, to, come, <laughs> to come here and do this. <laughs> yeah. I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit miffed here. And so I think, I think the role technology will play is equal parts attract um, equal parts attracting but also retaining that talent to go i spend more of my time wrestling with things i have models that i can work on and i can introduce things that i'm trying to weigh out whether this is going to have an impact or not or what that might mean if we weight something a bit differently and, and even and have some sort of value that you feel you're able to sort of put out and even like steps beyond that right when they can start to collaborate to build technology or to yeah. create yeah. new technology that helps them in that specialism yep. you know if you're i don't know a let's go back to the rocket scientist you know that maybe you've got you know, the ability if you've got software engineers in your team and data scientists in your team to model the probability of success on missions yeah you know with some fun software that you've helped work with yeah. or partnered with universities to build or whatever it might be yeah I, but you're absolutely right i think we're probably more at risk of alienating people who've just joined who decide it's not for them yeah i than in some ways failing to attract them i think they're, bo they're both strong risks yeah in some ways for the exact reasons you say it's like not enough people have heard about us then they really do when people do hear about us and they do get into the industry they get so frustrated with the boring repetitive manual admin that they have to do yeah. that they look elsewhere for a 
80 20 the other way around right <laughs> I, yeah. which yeah. well I, and again I, I think in many ways especially with the the generation coming out of university now is um, there's a bit of a an expectation for how technology works in big organizations mm -hmm. I don't think insurance is amazing yet but I also don't think it's as bad as people perceive I think most times when you're a fresh grad you come out of school and you're like oh, I'm going to this big or I'm going to Coca-Cola it's gonna be so technology focused and driven or swish and it's it's actually just oh, it's just eight-year-old computers and spreadsheets. It's like yeah. I think I think there's this perception gap that they've created. Um, but I think us continuing to invest in it as at least showing there's this push towards making that contribution heavier. Absolutely. But we'll spend loads more episodes talking about our love for reinsurance and how we attract young people to this space. It's well, I mean, you know, we are, we core are, to our mission. We are coming short on time, but I did want to ask you. We've we've done a very broad insurance version of this, but I. Why, why should people work in reinsurance? Why, why is reinsurance the, the best place for talent? How is, how is the reinsurance industry doing when it comes to the war on talent? I think, I think it's, it's, too, it's very hard in the attraction of talent because mm -hmm. it's, we've all had this conversation. We talked about it in the first couple of episodes of the podcast, but that sort of what reinsurance is explanation you have to give when, when you say what you do. So no one knows really about it unless you get into it. So I think there's certainly a, education piece to attract talent there um but i think it's another level deeper it's understanding the macroeconomic impacts and the macro components of these underlying things that allow this to work so if you like sort of the lens of that economics sort of position of going mm. thousands of factors are driving what these you know these shifts in society uh if those kinds of if that kind of thinking is attractive and is interesting to you, like this is a perfect industry for that, right? So I, that's I think that's why this is one of the most interesting spaces. I agree, and I, th I think it's also very good for people who relish the nuances, but also don't want to be too deep in any one set of weeds. Yeah. Like like it almost. I mean, for me certainly that was part of the appeal. I was this idea that you're you're not just the world's leading expert on the transportation of cars, mm. for example, which is a very interesting niche. But actually, you're somebody who has to take into account several niches, yeah. almost like a multi-niche expertise, yeah. right, as part of building a portfolio. And it is that spinning multiple plates of how do I balance my exposure to political risk in this set of geographies plus also my marine exposures and cargo exposures in these geographies versus the amount of hurricane and typhoon risk and earthquake risk I'm willing to take on. Yeah. And having enough of a, a grounding in all those different areas to be able to build, you know, commensurately balanced uh, risk portfolios yeah. at, at a higher level. That, it's fascinating. Yeah. And then also managing the margin between insurers and reinsurers. This, there's so much to balance that you can never get bored. Yeah, well, and and this is the reason I think we'll continue to talk about this subject matter on the podcast is Vicki Carter's podcast talked about it. Russell Higg Higginbotham's talked about it. Like it's central to what leadership cares about, mm. but it's also deeply fascinating for how we continue to build a mm. better environment for, for talent in our space. Yeah. So with that, we will see you next time on the Reinsurance Podcast. And if you're not persuaded to join the industry and you're listening to this and you're new, then... Uh, Welcome Keep aboard. listening. <laughs> <laughs> Just email Get us in. your CVs and we'll see who we know. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> we'll try to help where we can. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks.